So, um, yeah, welcome. My name is Björn Kimmenich. Uh, I'm the lead IT architect at Kühn & Nagel, which is a logistics company based in Switzerland slash Germany with almost 70,000 employees. Um, and as a part-time side job, basically, I'm the project lead of the OVASP juice shop project. And it's not called OVASP juice box, like some people uh, call it. So it's juice shop. So, um, and this talk is about um, how I do open source development, and I would like to share some things that I found out work and don't work, so to help you make your own open source projects better. So, first of all, uh, first chapter, who, who knows the OWASP Juice Shop project already? Hands up, please. Who knows the project? Okay, not so many. I just have like three slides of introduction. So the OWASP Juice Shop is an intentionally insecure web application. Um, you might know there's tons of those available online for free, like for local installation or even in, in, uh, deployed in the cloud and everything. But um, the main difference of the, between uh, others and the juice shop is that uh, the juice shop is written in some really, really uh, modern web architecture. So it's like completely written in JavaScript. So JavaScript, Angular JS front end, Node.js back end. So it basically has a broken REST API, it has a broken client, it has a broken things all over the place. In total, it has like almost 40 different vulnerabilities which you can exploit and if you find them, you get like points on a, on a scoreboard which you can uh, also find in the application. It's hidden there. So it's basically the first challenge is to find the scoreboard. We might see it actually during the talk. So there's also a second project which is part of the same OVAS project but it's on, on GitHub, it's a different repository which is a small extension to do uh, capture the flags. So it's basically a small command line tool which you can use to populate a database uh, from CTFD, which is an open source uh, CTF platform. And yeah, that's, this is currently in the making, this part of the project. So, and one thing, um, oh, seems to be broken somehow. Well, uh, actually the juice shop is uh, an OVAS project since September last year. And as such, it started of course as an incubator project, but during the project summit prior to this, uh, this uh, conference here, it got promoted to lab status, so finally made it. Okay, so let's talk about um, anti-patterns in open source software or open source development process. Um, some of these might actually also be present in regular enterprise projects, but I try to focus this on open source. First anti-pattern I came up with is uh, called this barren readme. So what does it mean? Well, it's basically a either completely empty or very, very ill-written uh, readme file for your GitHub repository, which is bad because this is basically the front page of any open source project, and it doesn't matter if it's on GitHub, Bitbucket, or wherever. The readme file typically is the first thing people see when they come to your project. And if your readme file looks like this, well, it's not very pleasing, right? So not very inviting to use it. Uh, you can do even worse, and some people actually do. So this is what GitHub generates for you if you just say, hey, give me a readme file. Well, or you can even have no readme file at all. So that's not the very best idea, right? Actually, the juice shop readme file is a little bit longer. I would say it might even be almost too long already, but uh, it has everything, like an introduction, what the project is. Um, it has complete setup instructions. It has some troubleshooting links and some, some other stuff in it. So it's basically quite a complete documentation just in the readme file. The CTF extension, I think, is, might even be a little bit better example because it's uh, a, lot, uh, a bit shorter than the rather huge main project documentation. So, and it again, it basically tells you how to install it, how to run it, and uh, has some logos and some badges in it, so it's like, you could say it, it might invite people to actually use this, use this project or at least check it out, more than this empty shell of a plain text only readme file. Another anti-pattern that you find in many open source projects, uh, I call this pile of issues. 
So basically you have tons of open issues in your uh, repository, let's say GitHub, so, and most of them are completely unanswered or at least unattended. So then it might look like this, right? So like 1,295 open issues. This is not an OVAS project, just to make this clear. So this is bad, right? Well, actually, you might say, well, if they have like 500,000 closed issues, it's not so bad, right? So let's have a look. So this is really bad, I would say. So they, I mean, they have 6,000 closed issues, but their oldest open issues are from 2011, and some of them are even labeled as bugs. So they have like six-year-old bugs, which some of, where some of them didn't even get a comment from the development team, right? So they were just opened and never touched. Then why do you do issue tracking, right? I mean, if you don't follow up on issues, people report, then why have issue tracking at all? <laughs> What's actually quite a good idea, in my opinion, <clears throat> is to label things appropriately. Because on GitHub, there's, you can either have an open issue or a closed one, so there's no different statuses you can put those through, really. But you can simulate something like this with labels. The minimum, I would say, is to label your bugs as bugs, and also to label your tickets or your, your issues, which you cannot follow up on right now, as something like blocked, for example, right? So at least people know, okay, this is not completely forgotten, there's just for some reason, there's no way to actually uh, work on this. And what I also find quite useful is some, uh, I use some external service called uh, HU board, which basically takes your GitHub issues and just presents them in like a Kanban board way, so you can basically drag and drop issues into different positions to prioritize them, and uh, yeah, this is actually quite nice to organize your stuff. Of course, this gets quite difficult if you have 1,000 open issues, so then the Kanban board is pretty huge, but uh, you shouldn't have so many open issues in the first place, I guess, right? PR disaster, that's another anti-pattern. Doesn't have anything to do with public relations, but with pull requests, of course. So you either ignore pull requests, or you have so many, so long discussions about each pull request, that the original author of the pull request is like so annoyed that he doesn't even want to get it merged anymore, right? One example here, uh, like this project, whatever it is, has like 146 open pull requests. Again, this might be good or bad, depending on how many closed ones they have, and I won't go any deeper on this. But here's one example of a pull request that was, I guess, successfully uh, flocked to death. Um, it's actually from the Z project, and just as a disclaimer, um, the Z project is actually doing a pretty good job with their pull requests. This is just an example how it can go wrong sometimes. So someone, I think in August 2016, opened a pull request, and the, the project team basically said, hey, uh, you're failing to implement some of our coding guidelines, so could you please do that? And this whole part of the discussion here, I think this was one week, right? So it got back and forth, like, hey, you have to still do this and you have to still do that. And at some point, uh, there was no response from the original author anymore. So, and then in, in November, um, one of the team members actually asked, hey, uh, are you still there? Do you still want us to merge this? And there was silence, right? So and this basically, this pull request basically died from, from that. And there's no way to actually, for the project team to just merge it now, because it had conflicts and stuff and they'd have no access. Um, to the code base of the original pull request author. So they asked for that, but he didn't respond anymore. He probably didn't want to. So the Zap team actually has a contribution guide, and this is one of the countermeasures for handling your pull request properly, and at least making people who want to contribute, uh, giving them a chance to actually see, okay, we have to do this and this and this. Right? So you don't have to be able to read this, but it's quite an extensive list of things you should actually do to get your pull requests merged uh, quickly into Zap. JuiceJob has uh, something similar, so basically says, hey, you cannot break any tests, hey, you should uh, comply with the style guide, and so on and so on. Um, with the JuiceJob, I go a little bit further even. Basically, I, uh, by, by brutal force, I, I make sure that the coding style guide is always uh, is always um, um, fulfilled, right? So there's no violations. 
I do that by just, when the tests are executed, the first thing that happens before the tests run is uh, the code is checked for style violations. And if there are any violations, then the tests don't even start and the build job just fails. Right? So and you can just do that locally as well. So you will not get your tests executed as long as your code is not compliant with the style guide, which is quite a nice thing. Okay, solicistic versioning. What could this be? Well, basically, the idea is that uh, you use the syntax of semantic versioning, so major.minor.patch version, but you don't really handle it like that, right? So you ignore the semantics of this idea. So the idea is that you do a major version when your API is having some incompatible changes, right? That's, that's the purpose of this semantic versioning thing. And you do the patch release only for bug fixes, right? Not for features. This is what the minor version is for. Just as an example, um, the AngularJS team in the 1.x versions, they use the syntax, but they don't use the semantics. So basically 1.0 is incompatible to 1.2, and 1.5 is incompatible to 1.6, and so on. It's okay that 1.x is incompatible to 2.x, yeah, because that's a major version upgrade. You might like that if you're an Angular developer or not, but that's fair play, because they say, okay, this is a new major version, and we make it incompatible. That's fine. Or not, but it's, it's at least fair uh, regarding semantics. And in the, the upcoming AngularJS release, um, they actually plan to do proper semantic versioning. So they actually plan to do a lot of major releases over time in the next year. So you will see 2.x, 3.x, 4.x in quite quick succession. In the Juice Shop project, I just recently released the 3.0 version. Um, and for just a very, very simple incompatible change. So with release 2.26, we introduced um, some configuration mechanism where you could basically apply a custom theme to the juice shop. This uses some configuration file. And I did some change with the, to the configuration file to simplify it, but this would have made uh, existing configuration files um, not work anymore. So this is an incompatible change. So if you take semantic versioning serious, you have to do a major release for that. It might not feel like something major, but it actually is a breaking change, and this needs to be its own major version. Major zero. Well, major zero is uh, an anti-pattern where the project basically stays in 0.x version indefinitely, right? So it never matures into a 1.x release which is typically what you do when you think, okay, this is good enough for people to actually use in production environments and in real projects, then you would, should typically do a 1.x release. If it stays in zero, well, it's kind of still in development and might be broken. But still, many enterprise projects happily use 0.1.5 versions of, project, of, of modules in uh, JavaScript, right? Because they're available and they work, at least they seem to. So just as an example, this little project here, which is completely unrelated to the Overst juice shop, I can tell you, um, actually is in version, I don't know, it's like 0 0.1.9. And I can tell you it will never mature into one point something. Okay, so if you want to check it out, just check out the juice shop and you will find some reason to check this out as well, I guess. Okay. These were some things that I think you shouldn't do in open source. So let's switch sides and talk about stuff that's actually a good idea. So if you're working with Git slash GitHub, I totally recommend to use Git flow as a process, at least a simplified um, Git flow. And the idea is that you use the master branch only for the official releases. Okay, so you don't fiddle around with the master branch. You do your development on a separate branch, which is typically called develop, 
And when you want to do a release, then you merge your stuff into master branch and push that. And this is just for releasing. Okay, this has the benefit of you always have a stable master branch. So when someone clones your Git repository, they will get the latest stable version, right? Not the latest version where you're just playing around and maybe it's broken, right? This is happening on the develop branch. So it's quite a simple idea. So you have the develop branch, the pink one down here, and you only merge back into master, into the blue ones, um, basically when you have something ready to release. And then you tag this with the version you want to push out and that's it. Quite simplified. The complete Git flow pro uh, process is a little bit more complex. They use feature branches and bug fix branches and all kinds of stuff. Um, for most open source projects, especially the smaller ones, this is completely overkill. So if you just stick with master and develop, you can work perfectly fine. This works very well for the juice shop since the beginning. Clean code. Oh yes, this is one of my personal favorite topics. I'm teaching clean code to software developers, uh, I think for over eight years now uh, at my company. So the idea is it matters to write the code in a clean, readable, maintainable way so that future generations of developers are actually able to pick up the project and keep working on it, right? If you just do quick and dirty hacking, in the code, I mean, not pen testing wise. Uh, so you write spaghetti code and it's complete, it's a complete mess and only you understand what, what happens in the code. Well, nobody will be able to support you properly, right? With your project. Nobody will be able to contribute. If you use clean code, that's much easier. So it's even possible, I would say, to write clean JavaScript, right? So this little code snippet here, not very long, but I, it's quite self explaining, right? So it's a function and it checks if some challenge of the juice shop has been solved, the premium paywall challenge. If not, then it's solved. And in any case, afterwards, it sends you some uh, under construction GIF. Well, doesn't sound like much of a premium thing, but well, never mind. It only costs one Bitcoin to actually unlock this in the, in the juice shop. Or you need to hack your way around this to actually get it. And then you will see the wonderful under construction here. Of course, if you know JavaScript, you probably also know that it more typically looks like this, right? So it's uh, quite messy, doesn't look very clean. And the juice shop, this is another example from it, um, also has code like this, right? I still try to keep it as clean as possible, but at some point you must realize, okay, this is just JavaScript, right? And you can try as hard as you want, but it's will never become something else than JavaScript. So kind of a mess is always there. But you can try your best at least. Automating tests. This basically, well, uh, saves you a lot of uh, pain and, uh, and, and things because if you don't have to test every change that you do or that every change that others do to your application or to your code base, manually, like this poor guy, um, that's actually quite nice because uh, you just have a suite of tests you can run and they will tell you if everything worked or not. So in the juice shop, there's different levels of tests. So there's unit tests for the user interface. So quite simple things like, as you can see here. So basically I expect that if you call this rest endpoint and you don't get some user object back or an empty user object back, then I would expect the contact us form to contain an anonymous string as the email address. So that's a very, very simple unit test. And I have tons of those in the project. Also, testing the REST API. Well, to do that, actually, I fire up an instance of the juice shop and run some tests against the running server to actually find out if the REST API behaves properly. So. And I have no clue why this happens here. So for some reason, this code snippet here is broken. I tried to fix it, but well, because this one, this one worked just fine, right? String is red and the rest is white and yellow, but here it's broken for some reason. If you can tell me why, then uh, I can send you a t-shirt. So the first person who tells me why this is broken in this thing will get a t-shirt via mail. 
And finally, the most important tests, in my opinion, at least for the juice shop, are the end-to-end -end tests. Basically, these are tests where I basically remote control a browser to do all the hacks against the juice shop, and then I go to the scoreboard and verify if these were solved. So that means if the test suite, the end-to-end -end test suite passes, so every test is green, that means that you can exploit every challenge that exists in the juice shop successfully. Yeah, so you get, can get 100% score on the scoreboard. And that's quite important to know if your use case is providing a broken web application. You actually want to know if it's breakable, right? If it's not breakable, it's broken, really. It's really broken then. So, yeah, this is a code snippet which actually goes to the scoreboard and finds out, um, is there a label which says, hey, this is solved for the particular challenge you're asking for, and if not, uh, well, then your test fails. What do you think is a realistic goal for test coverage? So how many tests should you actually write? Hmm. How, give me a percent number. 20? Okay, who's more, more than 20, anyone? 20%, are you happy with that? Anybody more than 20%? No? Okay, so if you, if you say 20% is, is a good goal, that means you're happy with not knowing if 80% of your code work, right? But might not be the best idea. So the best, the goal you should go for, for test coverage is 100%, because you want to know if your code works. You will not get 100% easily. You might be somewhere below 100%, but you should at least try to get there. So the juice shop test coverage numbers are like 95% for the main project and 97% for the extension, which is quite good, but well, there's still five or three percent to improve. Another nice testing tool that I like very much is uh, mutation testing, actually. What does mutation testing mean? It means that you test if your tests actually test the right stuff. So mutation tests work um, by modifying your code. So they basically, like, if there's a plus sign somewhere in the code, they make a minus sign out of that and then rerun your test suite. And if then no test fails, then you have a, what they call surviving mutant, right? So the one mutation didn't cause a failing test. So they know, okay, there's no test that actually verifies this piece of code properly. And here's some example from the Juice Shop CTF project. I'll just show you one. So for example, down here, there's actually a surviving mutant that says, okay, this line, some insert statement generating some ID, which is 10,000 plus some challenge ID. Um, there's no test that would fail if, I, if this would change to 10,000 minus the challenge ID. Okay, so basically I can say, well, I don't really care. I just want to make sure that I have no collisions for the IDs with some previous inserts here. So this surviving mutant is not so bad. If you click here, then you can see that Lots of other mutations actually triggered a failing test, so the mutation test tool is happy about that. So they killed the mutant then. And also for mutation coverage, 100% should be the goal, right? And the juice shop numbers is like 92% for the main project and 98% for the extension. Well, for the Main project, it's only 92% of the user interface code. So that might be roughly like 30% of the whole code base. So I'm cheating a little bit here. But well, never mind. It's actually quite hard to test the, the whole backend stuff. Okay, so um, continuous integration and continuous deployment. So who's using some CI service like Travis or at least some Jenkins server in their daily work? Okay, well. That's good. And you should, because these things can actually do quite a lot of work for you. And I want to, instead of showing boring slides, I will try to show you how this actually is working in, in real. So uh, we will do a live release now. Well, live, live things in presentations are always awesome because everything can break, basically. But, well, that's part of the fun, I guess. So this is the um, release dashboard of the juice shop, so the last builds were passing, 
And these are the latest versions. And what I have here, I have prepared a release for the juice shop, 3.1, which adds some hint functionality, and also a 1.1 release uh, for this application here. And well, here's my overview for the Travis build, so I could actually see when it build is launched, if it works or not. So let's try to release this. So what I prepared already yesterday is I committed everything, and now I just have to push the changes to the master branch. And just hope that the internet connection is still working. Okay, this looks good. And I do the same over here. For the CTF extension. And this looks also quite good. So let's see, let's refresh this. As you can see, there's two builds now being uh, run, one for the master branch and one for the tag, actually. And the same for the CTF extension. There's even some more stuff happening in behind the scenes. So if I refresh my, my Docker page, for example, where the Docker containers are built, you can see there's four builds running and creating new Docker containers at the moment. If you look at the currently released version of the Juice Shop in my test instance on Heroku, well, you see it's like 3.0.1, like we would expect. So maybe if the build is fast enough, we will see at the, at the end of the presentation that there's a 3.1. That's what I hope for. So, but maybe it's too slow. We will see. In the meantime, some more things that I find quite helpful, um, quality metrics. Metrics are always dangerous to some extent because they might actually lure you into some false feeling of, hey, everything's fine and we are really good. But some metrics are quite useful. So for example, um, I use this cloud service called Code Climate, which is free for open source projects, which actually, actually tries to calculate how good your code base is. This is the top graph here. And it also gives you a rough idea, hey, how's your code coverage developing? So that's the graph at the bottom. Another useful service, also free for open source projects, is BitHound, that also calculates all kinds of things. For example, um, if your dependency is up to date and uh, also how your coverage looks like and how much of, uh, how many uh, security issues you, ha you have in your existing code base, actually. They try to analyze that. For free, but only for open source, of course. For the CTF extension, I use a different service to um, manage the code coverage. And as you can see, with the past release, I had a drop from like 97% to 83%. So in the slides, I told you it's like, hey, it's 97%. Um, but I didn't push the change that will dump it down to 83 yet. So. And actually, there's one metric which is more important than all the others, and it's this one. Do you know that one? That's the, in my opinion, that's the most important metric for open source projects. It's a truck factor. Okay, so the truck factor basically says how many people from your development team can be run over by a truck and until you can basically close down your project because there's nobody left who can actually manage this. And there's huge open source projects, also in OVASP, which I would say have a truck factor of one. So if the one guy who knows everything leaves or gets run over by a truck, whatever you prefer, um, the project is dead, right? And this is not good. Even projects which have a truck factor of two or three might be dangerous, right? Depends. So what goal should we have for truck factor? Like, the best thing would be to, the whole development team could have a plane crash or be run over by one or several trucks, and the project would still be able to survive. How? 
because the code is so good and the tests are so complete and easy to, uh, it's easy to just jump into the project and uh, pick up the work, right? I mean, you, for the juice shop, you would actually have to know a little bit about JavaScript. That's a precondition. But you don't have to be a juice shop expert to actually work on this project, yeah? which is also shown by contributions, which I get, where I, no, nobody asks me before, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? Yeah? People just do changes and commit them and uh, create pull requests. And I can just merge them as long as the tests are run, which is great. Controlling your dependencies. That's also an important thing you should do in, in uh, enterprise-grade projects. So, for example, also a free service, Gymnasium. Um, it actually checks if you're, the modules or libraries you depend on, if they have security issues or if they are outdated. So green is basically up to date. Yellow is outdated and red is, ooh, there's some problem here. And the, for the juice shop itself, of course, there are some libraries which have problems because that's the main purpose of the juice shop, to be broken. Okay, so that's okay to be red. The CTF extension, well, there are some outdated things. Well, but there's at least no security issues. No known ones. And for this completely unrelated little side project, uh, here, hey, it only has one dependency and it's up to date. Great. And this you can all get for free automatically if you use a tool like, for example, Travis CI to do your build automation. It will then pass on information to another cloud service which will then calculate these scores and uh, well, you get the information for free. Okay, so for the last few minutes, some new things you can do wrong. Even if you try to do everything right, well, you can, of course, now get different kinds of problems and do different kinds of things in the wrong way. For example, instead of having a, a barren readme with no information at all, you can now do the batch barrage, which is basically you just put tons of labels and blinky icons and stuff on your readme, and it looks like this. Well, that's not much better than having no README at all because nobody can find anything in here. Of course, this is a fake example, but even in my real README, well, there are some places where I would say, okay, this might already be a little bit too much stuff on one screen and too many colors. If you use a CI server, you can run into the problem of having a coin flip CI, that's how I call it. So you basically get Build passes, build passes, build fails. Build passes, build fails, build passes. But you didn't even touch a piece of code, right? So maybe you just updated your readme six times, and this is your build, build result. That means you have some problem either with your CI provider or with your test suite or anywhere, right? Because if you touch no code, the build result should always be the same, shouldn't it? So, while I'm thinking about it, well, uh, well, how, how the live release might be going. Well, I'm crossing my fingers, and but I won't look now, because uh, if I look and it f it's already failed, then I would be like, ah, for the rest of the presentation. And so I just leave it for the, as a mystery for the, for the last minute, if it worked, or if it's still running, maybe. Another anti-pattern, free beer. And as everybody knows, there is no such thing as free beer, right? And transferred into the open source space, it means that, okay, you have some services and they don't cost anything money-wise, but there's some catch, right? So either some hidden cost or something that just annoys you. For example, one service which is called uh, Issue Stats, which is, has a quite sweet idea. It tries to tell you how long it takes for you um, between and GitHub issue and pull request being opened and being closed. So it calculates the time difference and tells you how, how fast are you with issues. The problem is most of the time the service looks like this, if you call it. So because they have some cheap or free server which always breaks down all the time, almost. So that doesn't help very much. For over a year, I used the cloud service source labs to actually run browser tests, different browser tests on my juice shop. But this, again, you get so little resources for free 
that it basically is, it, it, it dies as, as soon as you have two concurrent builds running, right? So they try to access this poor small server on or VM on, on source lab side and this just doesn't work. So you would be forced to buy some more resources or what I did, uh, I just dropped the whole concept of using them at some point because it doesn't, I don't have money to throw around. I need that for stickers and for t-shirts and stuff, but uh, I cannot pay source labs for their VMs. And finally, um, contributor laurels. So not giving enough credit to your contributors. This is, this is a really bad anti-pattern. It's easy to counter. You just list your contributors in some place, for example, in your readme file. Some contributors actually deserve a little bit more attention, so I have them here, quite huge. So George, Timo, and Yannick actually provided some big contributions to the juice shop recently. So, and I think that's worth actually being, being shown. But committing to your Git, so providing code is not everything in open source. There's other kinds of contributions. For example, in the juice shop, there's like 16 different languages right now, which have been, the translation have been done by different people, and that has nothing to do with the whole Git, GitHub thing. So there's a whole list of people who actually helped translating the application, and they don't show up anywhere right now. So that's something I need to fix. So to make visible, hey, these guys helped with, um, with translations. Then there's also people who actually write blog posts about the application, or they actually do some live hacking and record this and put it on the podcast, right? So uh, you should list this also as well, I guess. And people, sometimes me, sometimes others, talk about uh, the application on conferences or meetups, and this is also something that I would say is a is a really good contribution because it helps uh, spread, word, spread, spread the word about the project itself. Professional counter to lack of appreciation for your contributors is to send them stickers. Okay, this is something I did right from the start. I, I'm sending stickers to, to first-time contributors. And this works like crazy, right? So people love stickers for some reason. Um, so I just mail everybody a sticker who's sending a pull request who's just opening a really good issue, uh, describing some crazy bug or whatever. If you are a serial contributor or you contribute something really big once, you might even get some more stuff, right? So like t-shirts, hoodies, polo shirts, marks, whatever. So it's always good to show your appreciation for every contribution you get. Okay, so. Chapter, not a number, well, okay, so let's, let's have a look at the release. So either it passed now, then I would be like, hey, cool, or it failed, then I would be like, oh, no. So let's see what it is. So let's refresh this, and yoo-hoo, do you see that? It says 3.1.0, and it was still passing. So let's just have a quick look, and yep. I see the time thing. If I refresh this page here, then you can see this has just been released. Yeah? So the juice shop is now released and it's version 3.1.0. While I was talking, I didn't touch anything in between, right? So this was all completely automated. I suppose the Docker thing is still running at least for some, because it's quite slow. So what one container already built, or one image built properly. For the juice shop CTF thing, well, that actually doesn't automatically trigger its publishing yet, but as the build passed, I can do that now manually. And as everything worked out there, I can now publish it to NPM as well. Yeah, okay. That takes a moment, and then it should actually appear as version 1.1. And you can see this over here, right? So I just released two open source projects in, let's say, less than 20 minutes without touching anything more than just 
sending this git push and that the rest happened automatically. Okay, so I'm out of time and just in time, I'm at the end of the presentation. So, thank you. And if there's still time for a question or two, yep. go ahead. Even if you don't, you can still grab some of the stickers in the first few rows, or you can get one from me right here. And as I said, it's a, the legacy version. It's the, the old logo, so really, really rare item soon. Okay, thank you.